Good morning. Roger. Good, you're here. How's everybody doing on this beautiful spring day? Do I look like spring? Yeah. Yeah, I decided if we all start wearing, you know, summer things, maybe summer will come around sooner than later. How's that sound? Yeah. So thank you all so much for being here. It's so awesome that this many people are here today. Can't hear it? Okay, let me get this turned up. We'll turn them up and then tell me how that is. Well, if Barry was here, this would all be done. Hello, hello, hello. How's that? That's good. Okay, great. Okie doke. Well, let's start today. If we could, please, we will start with... Uh, Bull, if Bull, if you will come up and we'll do our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Uh, for those of you that are new here, we generally face the large uh, 1940s flag because everybody can see it. So, Bull, thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Okay, I would like to thank, of course, the wonderful people who help support this. The very first thing we want to do is thank all of our volunteers. Once again, I'll tell you, this would not be happening without them. There's no way I could do this alone. So, all of our volunteers, raise your hands, please, that are all over. Let's give them a huge applaud. Yeah, they set up the tables, they take them down, they get all the food done, everything, just so we can have a great time. We want to also thank, of course, Treasure Valley Coffee, because we love their coffee. And, uh, yeah, and they donate that coffee for you guys, you men and women, every single month to this event. Our sponsors, and we greatly want to thank our sponsors for this month, is the Margaret Mortensen and her family. Those of you that were here last month and listened to her, Wonderful talk about early days of uh, Napa Airport. Um, their family wanted to sponsor this this month, so thank you so much to that wonderful family. Um, this is a this is a, a booklet that um, we have on Sunday. Uh, Jerry uh, Borman, who is an author of biographies of World War II and Vietnam veterans, including Colonel Bernie Fisher. Uh, we'll speak in Boise. It's free, and the public is all invited. Uh, the program begins at 7 p.m. at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Five Mile Road, uh, south of Amity. It's a free speech, a free talk about the true story of a POW's daring escape from Nazi Germany. So that sounds pretty compelling, and it's free to everyone. I have this. I'll put it on the table over there uh, for any of you that want to come and look at it and, and see what it is. It's, uh, the date on that is uh, March 15th, Sunday, March 15th. And then Lance brought, he's got a whole bunch of these to give away. America will never forget their sacrifices. And this is uh, from one of the groups that went to the, on the honor flight back to D.C. And he's got, where are you, Lance? There you are. So you've got a box of Lance's right here. And he'll put those over on the table, too, uh, also. Over there where we have all the pamphlets, you know, to give away. Um, I want to remind um, everyone that, uh, where is, where's George? Okay, George back here, Cloverdale Funeral uh, Homes. Uh, they have the tickets for the Bravo feature. Those of you that have already signed up, he'll be standing right about there to give you your tickets, those that still want tickets. Uh, it's, uh, is it March 2nd? No, today is March 2nd. The 30th, yeah, I guess that was already gone. Sorry. Don't take the tickets. You already missed it. Okay, so it's March 30th, and uh, he, they have free tickets for those of you that want to go to see the film. It's a pretty, uh, pretty compelling film. Yes. Okay, the only way we can get more, once he runs out today, he can get more, but you need to sign up for them. And there again, they're on our sign-up table right here that you'll see when you go over where we have all the brochures. 
uh, the Egyptian, correct? Yeah, Egyptian theater. So it should be pretty, you know, I've seen it. It's very compelling. And, of course, the, yes. They're looking for memorabilia that can be borrowed, put in the marquee, uh, inside behind glass of Vietnam era. Uh, anything you have you'd like to have on display there during the, the showing, then uh, get a hold there again of, um, of George, um, and, uh, and then he can help you with that. Okay? Um, the Vietnam Memorial, uh, our commemoration of the Vietnam War, is about to have its very first of the series of six. It's the 28th of March, Saturday from 10 to 1. Um, and I need for every one of you to come so I can sleep. I'm a little tired. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm so excited to have this start. I just can't tell you how much this means to me and this incredible group of men who have pulled this whole series together. It, there's nothing like it in the in the country that I know of uh, that, that will be commemorating our, and honoring our Vietnam veterans like this series of symposiums. And, of course, the ending will be in August, August 29th, uh, where we're going to have the Welcome Home Party. Um, uh, Agribeef is sponsoring that. They're going to provide all the hot dogs and hamburgers and the drinks and this sort of thing. And um, so it's going to be a really great way to end the symposium. But I've got a whole bunch of these flyers. We also have, of course, our brochures over here that will explain everything to you. So take one for you. Um, if you want me to email anything to you that you can forward on to your friends, please do. We want as many people as possible to attend these, these symposiums. They're, they're just going to be in incredible. The first one is the intro of the war, which we'll talk about. Um, and General Mark Schmidt and uh, John Sterling will pretty much be heading off that one. We'll talk about Vietnam, the myth of Vietnam, where Vietnam is, uh, why we entered the war, and um, uh, that sort of thing. That'll be that for the first session. It should be really, really interesting. And then we have the ground war, how that was fought, who fought it, where it was fought. Uh, then we have the fixed wing war, which of course are the jets and uh, the technology that we use during that that part of the war. That uh, and you know the, the role that the jets played in Vietnam. Um, there's a lot more to that than than just that. But we also have that one of our speakers that's coming to that one, the fixed wing war, which is in May, is Christina Oles. Her father was. Uh, Brigadier General Robin Oles, and she has written a book about his life, and she'll be specifically talking about his role in Vietnam at that one. Then, of course, we have the helicopter war, which was a huge part of Vietnam. And uh, then we have the POW-MIA war, part of the war, that's July. And then in August is the ending. And so uh, General Gary Saylor will be our ending speaker and um, welcome our, our Vietnam veterans home. So I've got lots of flyers, information. Take as many brochures as you want. If you think you can pass them around, that would be a big help. Um, and so now we're going to find out. Oh, and one other thing. Please join the museum membership if you haven't. We really want to. We're on a march this year to increase our membership. We'd like to at least double it. And uh, so if you haven't joined, please do join the membership. It's awesome to have you as part of our family here. Uh, if you already are a member, you can give one as a gift. Please do, or tell other people about it, how great it is to belong to this museum. That's, that'll be a big help for us. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, now, new people. Let's find out who is here for the first time. Do not be shy, because we will find you. I promise. Okay. Yes, so over here. Here's, he's going to start. And Heather will be giving out our Veterans History Project envelopes. Um, and those of you that have already heard me say this a million times, I will keep saying it over and over again. Sir, if you would stand up. I'm Pat O'Loughlin. Uh, I was a Korean War veteran, 1st Marine Division, Baker Company, 7th Regiment. Thank you, sir. Do you live here locally? Yes, I live in Boise. Thank you so much for your service, and we hope you'll come the first of Tuesday of every month. Heather will be giving out these envelopes. Um, those of you that have already participated here in the Vet Veterans History Project program know what I'm going to say. All of you that are new, it is so critical that you come to the museum and allow us to preserve your history. Um, I'll be right over. I've got some here. 
Um, to preserve your history, Heather will be giving a VHP packet to all new people. All you have to do is call the museum, come here, and we will film your history. We will be giving you a copy of the film for your own family to have, probably for the first time, to listen to you really tell your stories. And then a copy will go to the Library of Congress, and we keep a copy at the Warhawk Air Museum. You can always go online at our, at our museum website and go into the Consistor Project, and you can view. We have about 40 already downloaded for you to look at. Okay, and so um, I think there's someone new here. I am Lucille Summerlin. I'm not a veteran, but I'm a proud wife of an Army veteran, 21 and a half years. And it's my first time here, and this is an awesome treasure that Nampa, Idaho has. We just moved here from Western Washington. And um, I want to thank you guys. Our son's retired Air Force. Our daughter was Army, so I love the military. And I'm so proud of my husband and all you guys. Thank you. I think you should go join tomorrow. Sounds like you're the only family member that did. Just go and get, get signed up. All right. Okay. Over here. Yes. Hi, I'm Brian Osbach, a U.S. Navy veteran, uh, also a National Service Officer with the Disabled American Veterans, and uh, here today, good friends, Mr. and Ms. Fulburn, have invited me, and this is a wonderful thing, so I thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Please come every first Tuesday of the month. Um, who would like to give a testimony, if they would, uh, that uh, uh, being interviewed, the Veterans History Project program, so that people can find out it's really a pretty good thing, that it was a good experience. Yes, yeah, okay. I didn't set this up ahead of time. Yeah, I'm Neil Durham. Uh, you all know Bull over there. But anyway, yeah, I got interviewed. Uh, went really well. You don't need to be bashful about it. And took about 45 minutes, something like that. And a few weeks later, in the mail, I get a disc, DVD. Well, I've got my own copy. And I would encourage those who have not done it to please do it. And, uh, sometimes things come out that never been spoken about. We received so many thank you letters from families who, for the first time, hear you telling your story. So please do. Heather will be giving each one of you an envelope. Uh, bring it in or sign it in today and leave it on the front desk. Yes, sir. This is Richard. Richard Vallier. I uh, served in July. Is that Navy TV? Richard? I didn't name it. This is for you, so I hope you come first Tuesday of every month and be with everybody. Thank you for your service to our country. Korean. Okay, where else? Now that I'm just facing this way. Anybody over here? Okay. And then I'll, I'll come back. Oh, we have new people here. Okay. Hold on. We're Larry and Judy Webb. We just moved to Nampa. Just been here a little over a month. Got our driver's license in Ohio. Our <laughs> I don't know a license plate. <laughs> I don't know a license plate, but uh, I published the book, uh, Hope for Wounded Warrior. It's the story of Bill Lynch, my friend and neighbor in San Diego, who was a survivor of the Guadalcanal battles, a Marine survivor. And it's always been a joy and a special privilege to be associated. God bless you. Well, God bless you, sir. And we hope you guys will come and make this your regular first Tuesday of the month. We do this every single time. So, yes. Okay, I'll make your way right over there. Hold on. This is Bill. My name is Bill Lobb. I'm a retired Navy chief. I served from 73 to 93. Uh, it's the first time I've been through one of these. What I'm, what I'm seeing is I, I belong to any group with an acronym. Um, VFW, Fleet Reserve, all those. I'm seeing not much participants and younger people. If you know younger veterans, let's try and get them out and get involved in stuff. Before we're all gone, we need to get this passed down to the younger group. You are right. So let's do that. If you know younger men and women serving, please invite them to come out. There is no charge to come here. Good morning. My name is Donald Blake. 
Uh, I served out of the First Marine Division of the Pink Thompson, Fifth Marines, Third Battalion, uh, McCormick, the United States Navy, and it was my first time here. I'm actually shocked because it's pretty big and it's nice. Um, it's a lot more than I expected. And I'm glad to see you guys. I feel comfortable and, you know, and a little bit nervous, but um, it's good to see you guys. Thank you. I served in um, Iraq three times and Afghanistan once. And um, did, I think one time I did a uh, went to Katrina. Did a lot of humanitarian work. It's been a long road, and I am re- recovering and slowly but surely. With you guys, though, it, it encourages me that it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's the first Tuesday of every month, so make sure you're here. Back here, do we have new people that have the guts to stand up and say, I'm new? Okay. Okay, let, let me cover this, and then I'm going to walk down that way next. Uh, I'm Phil George from Homedale. I served in the Navy from 69 to 75. Board the uh, nuclear cruisers Bainbridge in South Carolina, both of which are now raised with us. Thank you, sir. Do you live locally? Yeah, I live in Homedale. Great. Yes, over here. Where? Where are we down here? Okay. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. All right. Here's the young people. See? Hi, I'm Airman Jake Slater. I'm pretty sure I'm the youngest one here. <laughs> um, I recently joined just a couple of years ago at Munition Systems out of Gamma Field. And right now I'm on a tour of assisting the recruiters. Well, you need to block off that first Tuesday of the month. And we are giving the VHP packages to people that are currently serving. We've had a number of those those uh, men and women that have come in and allowed us to preserve their history up until now, uh, what they're doing now. And this sort of thing, if you've noticed, there are a lot of movies being made, and we're trying to, we're trying to outdo Steven Spielberg or Tom Hanks and have the real stories told. See, so, yeah, that's what we're up to. Okay, who over here? I saw some new ones here. Here, over here. Oh, cool! Look, I love that hat. I am a hat and shoe person. What do your shoes look like? Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, my name is Claude Dodds. Uh, I served out at uh, uh, Gallon Field, seventy-two to um, seventy-eight, and I'm very That's basically my story. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We hope you'll block off that first Tuesday. Um, we should be very, very proud of our guard because it's, I believe, one of the most active, you know, has been over the years in the country. And we have a great speaker today, General Sailor, that will be telling us a little bit about it. Terry. Yes, I'm Terry Harrell. I'm currently the chairman of the Call of Veterans Council, which is an organization uh, made up of the American Legion, the VFW, and the DAV chapters over there. Served uh, almost 32 years, a combination between the Army and the Army National Guard. Got to uh, tour Iraq with the uh, the brigade from Gallon Field or from Idaho. Uh, retired back in 06 and spent a lot of time now uh, with the group working to uh, help veterans. So, uh, Caldwell Veterans Council, the Caldwell Veterans Memorial Hall, the old library in Caldwell, 1101 Cleveland Boulevard. 7,200 square feet. We're, we're remodeling it, fixing it up to where it'll be. Someday something, uh, not a museum, but a place where veterans can come together and get services and, and come and share coffee and, and bullshit a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, well, you're not going in a competition with us. No, I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Right here? Okay. Are you new, John? All right. My name is John Muirhead. Well, John Muirhead, uh, Navy veteran, submarine service. Um, I'm also the uh, um, also the uh, the vice chairman of the Caldwell Veterans Committee and the uh, project manager to convert that old building into a, a veterans memorial. So I would encourage any and all of you to stop by when you.
you see our trucks out there working to stop in and look and see what we're doing. We've got some plans in there and, and art, an artistic rendering of uh, what the building's going to be like when we're, when we're doing it. I'm really excited about the project. Thank you. You're welcome, and it is a wonderful project that they're doing. Okay, who else do we have? Where? Raise your hands. Okay. Have we met your kid? Then let's meet the kid. All right, here we go. Hi, my name's Alex Hollison. Uh, I'm a junior in Boise High, and uh, I'm, I'm re I recently just started studying World War II. And at school, really all they teach us is about the causes of the war and the effects and political, social, and economic. But I came here with my stepdad, Bill, uh, to basically see what, what the veterans on a personal level experienced and the great service you've done to our country. And so I'll be uh, incorporating some of the stories I've heard uh, into an essay that I'll, I'll share with my peers at the school so maybe they can know about uh, what you guys did. Thank you. Good for you. Thank you so much. Thanks for bringing me in. Hi, guys. I'm Harv Ryder, 26 years Air Force. I retired in 2000 on April Fool's Day, which most of my friends thought was extremely appropriate. Uh, it, about the Veterans History Project, and I have done it. It's a marvelous experience. Uh, not only does it record the human side of military service, but it's something each of you will walk away from with a new heart. The one thing I would suggest is that not to jump into it uh, without some preparation. If you have the opportunity, you want to do it, please sit down with a piece of paper and write out your history, at least names, dates, places, to the best of your ability, because that will make the interview so much better for you and for the system itself. It's the one thing you walk away from that and say to yourself, there was a dozen things I wish I had said, but I didn't remember at the time. Prepare for that, and it will be a better experience for you and for the process. Thanks. Great words, and that's the truth, too. Um, the interview is limited by the Library of Congress time, um, and so it's generally about an hour, and we inevitably... After the camera is stopped, everything is rolled up, we continue talking, and some great things come out. So, yes. Yes. Bob. Good morning. I'm Bob Seal. I uh, was in the Navy for 24 years, and I actually served with Phil George back there. Uh, Vietnam time was on USS Enterprise in 1971. I'm currently the uh, Vice President of the Idaho State Council of the Vietnam Veterans of America, and we're working on a project to find a photo for each of the Idahoans who died in, in the Vietnam War, and we're down to eight. I have a list that you, you'd like to look at later. We'd uh, feel really good about getting the last one. Thank you. Many of you probably saw that in the newspaper. So, horrendous project. Um, uh, any of you that are here also that are to, uh, involved with organizations such as Bob's, please uh, email me your email address or leave it here because I will send you the Vietnam veteran commemoration flyer, okay, that you can then, you know, pass on to folks that you know would like to come to that. There is no charge. It's free. We'll have a separate entrance uh, for symposium attendees, and anyone who's attending the symposium will be coming into the museum at no charge. Okay, so please do email me. Uh, just go to our website or ask for a card before you leave with my email on it so I can send you the information. Yes, sir. I just wanted to uh, wonder how many World War II veterans are here today. I'm one of them World War II veterans. I, the war started in '47. Three weeks later, I volunteered for the Marine Corps and I went overseas and to Japan, or not to South Pacific. I served it in the invasions of Tarawa, Saipan, Tinian, Okinawa, Iyashima, and Agunishima. 
and six divisions. While I was there, I, <laughs> I contacted a disease that I don't like to talk about much, alphonsitis, if you know what that is. And uh, I was just wondering why the World War II veterans were not mentioned once in a while anyway. Well, actually, this museum for 25 years has been dedicated to the World War II veterans. All of you that come here know that. This Vietnam commemoration has nothing to do with World War II veterans being less considered or less respected or less in awe of all of us. This happens to be the U.S. Defense Department's year to honor Vietnam veterans for the 50th year commemoration of the end of the war. And that's when we became a partner of the U.S. Defense Department as a museum that would participate in that honoring. And so that's why this year, 2015, is so important for this museum to uh, be a part of that commemoration. Um, we decided that this committee of, of men, myself, and the people that have been involved in it, we didn't want to just give out pins or, um, you know, say thank you. We wanted to do something. This is an educational museum. And so as a result, we created a very compelling, very honorable, very wonderful uh, series of educational lectures that will teach the public about what Vietnam was. All right, so that's the purpose of this generation. We hope all of you, or whatever war you served in, will come and honor uh, that history and those men who and women who participated in Vietnam. It's something that has never happened before in this country, and so this is, this is long overdue. But it, it in no way diminishes the importance of our of our World War II veterans, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I want to make one more announcement. Uh, World War II veterans, this is for you. On April 21st at the Caldwell uh, High School Auditorium, there's going to be a program called The Day of Remembrance about the Holocaust. And a uh, professor, Dr. Howard Berger from the University of Idaho, will be talking. Everybody's welcome. Veterans are welcome. But particularly World War II veterans are going to be honored there. And there's going to be, uh, Caldwell Transportation is going to be providing the, uh, uh, the uh, transportation for you, World War II vets. I'm going to have a sign-up sheet over here. We just need your name and phone number, and you'll be contacted. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that's new here? Raise your hand high. I don't want to leave anybody out. And I do want to say as a side note, too, um, this also does not, our Vietnam commemoration program uh, does not in any way diminish the importance of our Korean veterans. They were, I mean, each one of you are so vital to this country. You really make up the fabric that protects this country and makes it the greatest nation in the world. Uh, it's because of our veterans that we have that fabric that you're all a part of. Uh, once again, it has it, we in no way diminish our Korean veterans who um, uh, really served our country. And, uh, you know, hopefully one of these days we can have, there'll, there'll be another commemoration service that will be coming up uh, that will take in for the Korean uh, War veterans also. But in the meantime, we certainly have 20,000 square feet honoring you and uh, all of the Cold War era. Veterans. Uh, so we've definitely done that. Yes. One more new person, and then we're going to turn this over to someone that we all know and love. My name is Greg Payne. <laughs> anyway, uh, I served in the Marshall Marine for three years, and the Japanese Air Force found me a ship and bombed. <laughs> And it damaged it real badly. And then they went over here in Port Angeles, Washington, and uh, I signed up for the Air Force. And where do you think I went? Right back to Japan. <laughs> for two years, occupation group. <laughs> and that was my big story. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for being here today. I hope you'll come the first Tuesday of every month. Okay. We're going to be on. Okay. You're not new. Please, sorry. 
this fellow here, I met him years ago, a good friend of mine. And uh, he's in the Marine Corps, and I served in the Navy and the Amphibious Force. In the Amphibious Force. And so I don't know whether I took him to or not, I don't know. But I was on the landing ship, though. And we took the Marines in to represent the Marines in the Navy. And also, there's only 10% of us who were two veterans left. I guess I understand the new 10. Well, your histories will always be preserved at the Warhawk Ferry Museum, and I have a sign up list for any of the World War II guys that want us to stuff them when they die, and we'll have a special corner. Just for you, I promise. And if you have a collection here, it'll go right next to your collection. I promise. Seriously. We we uh, are honored to always preserve our veterans histories here at, at this museum. So, okay. All right. You covered up all my notes. All right. Most of you know who, of course, who General Major General Gary Saylor is. Um, he is the commanding general for the Idaho National Guard in Boise. And he began his military career in 1971 as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. He joined the Idaho Air National Guard in 1977 as a weapons systems officer for the 124th Tactical Reconnaissance Group. He served as both 124th Wing Commander and Deputy Commander General. Air before his appointment to Adjutant General in January 2010. He has more than 2,800 hours flight time with 372 combat hours. I would like to present General Gary Sailor. Come on over here. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to have you here, sir. It truly is. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you, Sue. Um, <coughs> Well, when I uh, agreed to come over here, I actually thought there was going to be 10 or 15 people. And so as I'm driving in, I see the cars and I'm thinking, I wonder what else is going on out here because, my Lord, there's going to be a lot of disappointed veterans if they came to hear me speak. And so I'm glad there's some other program and, and hopefully nobody made it. Made a trip over here to, to hear me talk is uh, you're going to be pretty unimpressed if you did. Mm -hmm. Well, um, a couple of things come to mind before I um, talk about a couple of things that I had in mind to, to let you know. First of all, I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that there's no group I center which I speak to than veterans. There's no group that I'm more intimidated speaking in front of than veterans. You guys are all brothers and sisters, and we've all served at different times and places and uniforms and conflicts and all that kind of stuff, but it's just something about people who have done that. You know, you know, a lot of our stories are different, and our circumstances are different, but it's just so awesome to see you, and I'm glad that you know, you know, I guess uh, coffee group has gone grown from a half a dozen to you know, everybody here today, and it seems like it's still growing, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all your service. Uh, we are the nation we are today because of the service that you guys and gals have done in the past, so get that out of the way to begin with. And the second thing I wanted to let Sue you know is that uh, she announced earlier that she's looking for uh, Vietnam uh, memorabilia to put in a glass cave place. Behind glass and uh, deserve all that. It's a good thing my wife's not here. She volunteered me, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And I'd probably be, be okay with that. So, mm -hmm. well, let me uh, just a couple things that I wanted to chat with you about. Um, and I, I, I like to, to say a few things, but I'd sort of like to answer questions or um, anything that you might have on your mind. I can, but to um, begin with uh, the, uh, the Vietnam um, celebration that the world had just put together, I think is really awesome. I know that uh, 
gentleman behind this at the DOD level. I've talked to him a couple times. He's talked about what other states, what some states are doing. And I haven't heard any state or any area that's still in the time of celebration that uh, is being planned and, and will come off here at the end of this month. So my hat's off to everybody who's put that together. I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, I'm not quite sure why I got in the talking about that event either, but um, I, I will because, um, you know, I was there at the end, some of you there at the beginning, in the middle, and I was there at the end of it, so I kind of get wrapped up and, and come home, and uh, I tell our soldiers and airmen all the, all the time, uh, there's been so many changes in all the time that I've served. Four years uh, continuous, but the, the best change we've gotten, you know, new and better tanks, new and better rifles, new and better ships, new and better airplanes. But the number one thing that I've seen change that is just heartwarming is the way our veterans today are treated versus the way they were at the end of that conflict. There's a, just a lot of bad stuff going on, a lot of bad feelings in the country, and so many of those. Uh, Young men and women came home and just, um, and I, I'm not putting myself in that category. I need to be there, but there were, there were so many. And I had friends and relatives that were just part of that group. It just, uh, it's just heartwarming to see the change today. Mm -hmm. To see where people you know, in first class on airplanes are giving their seats up to somebody who's coming back. See the captain announce that they've got these weapons, and it just brings tears to my eyes when I see it. And it's great. So we healed a lot of those wounds, and uh, this celebration will heal some more. And, uh, and we're back together as a nation, which is hopefully where we can we will stay. Um, what I wanted to give you today was just an update on um, some of the things going on in, in the defense department. I can tell you the number one thing uh, in everybody's mind, whether it's the uh, Air Force, the Navy, Marine Corps, I mean, it doesn't matter, is the budget. Um, you know, as a country, as a nation, we're really financially strapped. Um, a few years ago, because the Congress couldn't come to any kind of agreement on the budgets, uh, they implemented this thing called uh, sequestration which is automatic cuts. If we can't decide how we're going to make cuts, we'll just take cuts across every every part of the budget. And, of course, that hits the Department of Defense uh, really tough. Um, just before that was uh, implemented, the Secretary of Defense had already implemented a two-year study to look at the department and figure out where there was waste, where there was excess, and so they'd already taken about a $20 billion cut. And then the sequestration kicked in, and that's, again, it's billions of dollars every year. So we're at the point now where the services, service chiefs, the four stars that are in charge, are saying we cannot take any more, any more cuts, and we will not be able to execute the nation's strategy. And in my time in service, and, and those who follow it, you know, the way we're supposed to operate is we look at the threat worldwide, we determine the forces and the force mix required to meet that threat for the nation, and then we budget to sustain the force. And we've got to a point where we set a budget and we figure out what kind of force we can buy. And that determines our strategy. And this is backwards, and that's where we're at today. Um, give you some numbers just on the, on the Air Force. Since the start of Desert Storm, the Air Force has cut 200,000 people out of the Air Force. And the Air Force is the smallest of the services. So they have gone from about 600,000 or about 500,000, down to just over 300,000, 300, 15, 12,000. At the same time, 
to start a desert storm, they had 188 fighter squadrons. 188 squadrons of fighters, just fighters. Today, they've got 54 heading to 49. So you can see what's happened in the Air Force, what's happened in all the services. We have just cut to the point where there's no more to cut. And literally, you know, we worry about um, what is the threat and uh, you know, who are we going to have to oppose. Um, you know, we still have Korea out there that's very dangerous. We have Iran who is dangerous today. It could be a lot more dangerous if they get new weapons. Um, we've got um, China. We've got Russia reasserting itself. So it's not like we don't have threats in there. We do. And so, from the Department of Defense standpoint, that is the concern. What is the budget going to be like, and what can we, uh, what can this country, what will they afford, what kind of force? Uh, what we can in all the services. Um, specifically, locally, uh, of course, the A-10, um, which is the primary mission of the Air Guard, has come under, um, you know, under the acts the last couple of years. Um, again, I heard uh, the chief of staff of the, the Secretary of the Air Force, he was here um, 10 days ago or something like that. Um, it's not that they don't like the A-10, Everybody acknowledges that the A-10 is the best airframe to do close air support. Um, you could ask anybody who's um, been on the ground looking for some kind of air cover, some kind of close air support. The A-10 is the, the choice platform. But it's a budget thing. Um, if you cut some airplanes out of a fleet, you can save some money, but the real savings come if you cut the entire fleet. Um, even though the A-10 is the airplane that they chose to cut, it's, a, it's only about 300 of them, so it's a smaller fleet. It saves them about $350 million a year, and about $3.5 to $4 billion over the life of the A-10. And they can use that money to buy new airplanes, which they say they need, and they do need. The fleet is worn out. It's been used hard for, uh, since the early 90s, and uh, the, the new airplanes, uh, there's only really one, that's the F-22, and it's, the numbers are so small that uh, you know, just, just not available to do much. So that's what they look for in the A-10, and I cut this airplane. Now, Boise um, or Idaho, the Air Guard, would be one of the first units to get out of business and that would not happen. It was supposed to actually happen right now in the district. And in this court, it was time for you. So the Congress last year said, no, we're not sure we like that idea. Air Force, keep it. So they kept it. They slipped the whole conversion thing for a year. Um, odds are they're going to do that again. Um, Senator McCain from Arizona is the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and of course that committee has a huge impact on services, and he's already been pretty bold in saying that he's not going to retire the A-10 until there's something else to take its place, not something that's on the drawing board or something that's going to be produced next year, but, you know, we fly one away and we fly another one in. So we'll probably keep the A-10 for, for a while. And, but it is, you know, an older airplane. It was actually developed in um, the Vietnam War. Um, you know, the idea was they ended up using the A1E and airplanes like that to do a lot of close air support uh, in Vietnam, and that was really the genesis for the A-10. We need something that can work with the troops on the ground. That can, you know, it's low cost. It's easy to maintain. Um, has a lot of loiter time. Things like that. And the A-10 was the uh, airplane selected. And so it's, uh, it's been around since the mid-70s. And it's been upgraded and modified many times. It's, it's a great airplane today. It drops all the precision weapons that any of the other newer fighter does, or any fighters do. So it's, it's really a, a solid airplane yet. 
And of course, they're using them you know, again over in the Middle East to fight you know, this ISIS thing. You'll hear stories about you know, other airplanes do the same mission. You know, it's only flying a small percentage of the sorties. And all those things are, you know, they're, they're true, but they're, they don't really tell the story. You know. um, it, it does all the missions, like they say, it, and it does them better. If they ask about, or if they looked at, you know, a, a warship of F-16s that can come on station, that can spend 10 minutes there before they're out of gas and have to go refuel. Versus an A-10 that can spend an hour there, or an hour, 15 minutes. So they actually looked at who was providing the support in, you know, some kind of missions as opposed to just sorties. They would see the A-10s leaving with them because it's, like I say, it can, it can cover targets for a long time as opposed to some of the other jets that can. Anyway, I know. Long term, I'm sure the Air Force is not going to back up. They want the airplane gun. What that means for the Air Guard, um, the current plan is for the Air Guard then to move to Mountain Home from downfield to Mountain Home. But not all of the Air Guard, that's really the kind of sad part. The part that's moving is the maintenance. That's what is most critical for the Air Force. They don't have enough people to maintain jets. And so, they use the maintenance from the Air Guard and some of the operators, or some of the pilots. But the rest of the wing, which is about 1,300 people, so about 550 of them go to the room. The rest of the people are for support people, like your aircraft refuelers, your supply, your, your medical, your finance, your security police, your fire department. Those people are not planned to move, so without airplanes, without a flying mission, there's no reason to keep those other people on board. And so our fear is, my fear is that, and we've already been told within two to three years, I mean, because of, again, because of budgets, they will all go away. So it's a big impact for the guard and you know, the air guard. We would stand up at least probably by 450 to 500 people. Um, and so, you know, I hate to see that happen. Again, I've been part of the unit for many, many years, and to see see it be broke up like that, I think, would just be a real travesty. Um, I also have great concerns that the space of a lot of our airmen live in this part of the town. Um, it's not very many live in our home and commute to Boise. Everybody lives. Boise and Meridian, and they have to call them. This is the part of the valley with the people. And so, to ask those kids, those young kids, to drive to Mount Home every day, and, you know, it's an hour and a half one way from this part of the valley. That's another big sacrifice. And again, it's uh, all volunteer service, you know. And, uh, these kids got other options, they got other things to do, especially now, I hate to say it, but with the good economy, it's tough on recruiting. You know, kids got jobs and they can. They can do other things with their time. So those are the battles that we're we fight on the A-10. Um, and we continue to fight those. Um, just hate to see that happen to a unit. You know, the Air Guard's been at Guiding Field since 1946. They moved out there. We um, got P-51s from the Air Force. They've been flying fighters out there ever since. Um, been involved in uh, just about every, well, every conflict you can think of since uh, the end of the Korean War. You know, we were the first guard unit to go to uh, after Desert Storm. Um, so we were there for two years, uh, either in Saudi Arabia or Turkey, flying patrol missions, and then the A-10s went to Kosovo for that campaign. Flew out of, actually flew out of Sicily up in the coast of some like seven and a half hour missions in the A-10. And then uh, back to the A-10s and Iraqi freedom. You know, back again for enduring freedom in Afghanistan. So they've been on the road you know, deploying in 
what they're doing to all of the services is just not sustainable. Someday, this country is going to be challenged again in a big way. And it's not going to be like it was for some of our great World War II veterans, but we have time to build up. Things are going to happen, and they're going to be over with before any of that can happen. And if you're not ready to go, then just hate to think of what the consequences would be. So that's my woes. Um, I don't mean to belabor it. But, you know, lots of good kids out there serving me. I, I appreciate your support of me. A couple of young women here today. Um, a young man that stood up a while ago, his dad. I would imagine that's his dad, same last name. Kind of looks like his dad. His dad's been in the air guard for a long, long time. And, um, served with him. I guess that's the duty of, you know, having been in forever. I was looking at that link trainer, and I don't think they had those in my joint, but it was, yeah, it was not that far away. But, you know, I see half a dozen or so folks here in the other days that I've served with. And, uh, great guys. And, uh, again, thanks you all for, for your service. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to. Either give you my two cents worth or tell you what I know about the subject. Yes, ma'am. Hello, this is Jeff Hall. Let me put you on the mic here, okay? Everybody can hear. Yes, sir. Our son uh, is retired Air Force. He was a nav on the 130s out here at Downfield. Are uh, they still using them a lot? He was a 141 nav, too. What was his name? Or what is it? Scott Summerlin. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. No, we do not have those 130s in the air guard anymore. What happened was in 2005, they went through this process called the Base Realignment and Closure. Right, that's what we called it. We looked at all the infrastructure and figured out where they have. Uh, uh, what they're supposed to do is look at infrastructure, bases, and figure out where they have access and close them. What they really used, did in 2005 was that they realigned missions more than closed bases. And so in that process, we lost those 130s. So we haven't had them. Um, the decision was in 2005. We actually flew those airplanes until 2009 when they were you know, taken from us. So it's a great mission. Uh, it's the only non, well, we still had the A-10s at the same time. So we actually had two flying missions at the time. Um, and we'd love to get some back, but you know, don't see it in the cards, frankly. Here's Chet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's the status of the F-35, and what is its mission in today's world war III? Let's talk about the status first. That's probably easy. Um, the, the, the problem with the F-35, what you hope will be, was all the acquisitions of new airplanes now just take years and years to get done. Back in the era of World War II, Korea, we could come up with a need for an airplane, and within probably five or six years, we could be producing an airplane. We could get it in the inventory, and it was there. You know, it was the Congress was appropriating money, and they were seeing the results. Airplanes today, back in the F-22, which is the, the last one that we really bought in any numbers, in the F-35, we're talking 20 years from the time that we say we need this airplane and we develop the concepts and we do the testing and the acquisition and we get the, the thing bought and then service. And so in the F-35, again, one of those big programs put together, going to be an airplane that Worked with the Air Force and the Marine Corps and the Navy. There was three different variants of it all going to be built. It was going to solve a lot of problems, and it was going to be a common purchase so we could buy a lot of them so the price would be lower. That was the idea. Um, and what happens is 
the manufacturer has all these milestones that they have to meet, you know, they have to do it. Let's say they, they do a design, and then they do a prototype, and then they fly it, and then they start testing it. And every time, every one of those milestones, there's budget authority allowed to do that. So between the aircraft manufacturer not making some of those milestones and the start and stop, uh, or the limited budgets in Congress to, to not move as fast as we could, the thing is, you know, again, it's like, it's going to be 20 years old before we get it flying, basically. So that's the production world. Again, you hear the cost of this thing, and it is astronomical, but the cost, those who don't like it, talk about it. the cost in the first design until, it, until it's on the assembly line. I mean, that would be like a car, you know, if you, if you had to pay for all that design and all that initial testing and manufacturing, you know, nobody could afford cars, but you program that out over the life of the vehicle, and if you're going to sell 200000 you know, the price goes way down. Kind of the same with the jets. That jet, they were going to be over 2000 in purchase. And so the manufacturer can amortize that out and say, this is going to be a cost. But when you say, okay, well, now we're only going to buy 1500 well, the Instead of amortizing that over 2000 now it's 1500 and pricing is 1200 and the cost just keeps going up and up. So that's the cost problem. And then the other problem is um, because of all these acquisitions and delays, um, you know, they, they want to keep the Congress buying the airplane. And so what happens is they start to fly the airplane and turn it over to the services before they should. So they have to fly these things hundreds of hours in all kinds of configurations, in all kinds of conditions, and in all, you know, the angle of tack, high speed, and all these different uh, ways that they have to test the airplane to make sure that there's no bugs in the system before the services start using it. So, in order to get this, the airplane out there and get it flying, they do it before all those tests are complete. And so, you end up with a few problems once it's operation. Of course, every time one has to make an emergency landing, it's like national news, you know? Well, it's just part of developing a new aircraft, a new system. Those things are going to happen. So, I think they're pretty much on track. They've been meeting the deadlines. Um, Congress is giving them money for what's called low-rate production to get all the bugs worked out. And there's actually a couple hundred of them out there flying right now. Um, there's a... a a base down in Florida, Eglin Air Force Base. That's the training base. And they're, they've got their airplanes and they're, they're producing, uh, they're, 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 they have students in training right now. The next base that's going to do training is down in Arizona. They're getting airplanes, their first airplanes right now. The Marine Corps has actually got a, quite a few people in the F 35. So the airplane is starting to show up in the inventory. Now, the second part of your question how it's going to be used. Excuse me. Um, we hear this talk back to the A-10 about the F-35 is the replacement for the A-10. And so, therefore, it would be doing the close air support mission. Um, if you're an A-10 guy or probably if you're a Marine or soldier or somebody on the ground needing that air cover, you wonder, well, how is the, air, how is the F-35 going to do that mission? And... If you will do that mission, will they actually commit that airplane that's going to be a $100 million airplane to do close air support? The Air Force says, yes, we are. The Marine Corps says, that's the reason we bought the F-35B to do close air support. That's all we do in the Marine Corps. You know, we're not doing all these other missions. Now, is it going to do it with the same big gun that the A-10 has? No, it's not going to have that gun. He says there's new weapons. They're only compatible on these newer jets that will do that same kind of mission. And they're talking weapons that I, I hope these weapons are more than just something on a drawing board, but yeah, they're, they're talking about the new kind of uh, cannon that shoots the projectile, you know, not much bigger than, you know, an inch, and it's, you know, it's an explosive charge, and it's got all these little tiny warheads in it, and you could carry thousands of those in an airplane, as opposed to, you know, what current cans 
carry that and it's there's no way to I mean, again, the laser guided rockets, you know, things that we really don't even have today, but those are the kinds of weapons they're talking about putting on this new airplane to do the close air support mission. So, in the future, who's going to do that? I think it'll be a combination of F 16s, F 15 Strike Eagles, and the F 35. And that's the Air Force Trump plane. Why wouldn't the F 10 be the ideal weapon? In today's world, and why are they going to you know, jump them or stop the program? Well, they're, they are planning on taking the airplanes and putting them in the boneyard. They are, that's the plan. And is it the perfect weapon? In many cases, it's the perfect weapon. What the Air Force says the, the A 10 is not a good suited airplane for a war in the Pacific because of the distances involved. Um, you know, that's what they say, so, you know, not what I say, that's what the Air Force say. And, and the other thing is they don't feel like the A-10 is survivable in a high-threat environment. And so, uh, six months ago, the Air Force four-star who, who runs all of the air combat command, which is all world fighters are, he made a statement that the a he could not send A-10s to the Middle East to fight ISIS because they could not survive in that threat environment. Now, what we say is, <clears throat> we don't operate that way. We don't send any airplane into that kind of arena until we take those threats out. So, the A-10s are operating there today. None of them have been shot down. The threats have been the threats that are significant to them. They're either not in place or they've been taken out. And that's the way the A-10 operates. You know, it's never the first airplane to go into an area because they're going in there to protect troops on the ground. And you're not going to put troops on the ground until you have air superiority. And, and if you have air superiority, you have to get rid of those high threat surface to air systems, which makes the A-10 survivable. So it's another one of the arguments to get rid of the A-10. Do we all believe it or accept it? Not necessarily, but, you know, these are two stars, not four. I don't make those decisions. You know. It's a great airplane. It's um, the life that the, it was projected to stay around until about 2028. Um, I mean, it's had, it has, it's has, some, it has had wing problems. It has some structural problems, but those have all been fixed. The wings have all been beefed up. It clearly could, could fly for another... 10, 15 years. I know General Saylor said he would stick around for a while for anybody that has more questions. Um, so probably a few of you will want to get up and walk around a little bit. And uh, I'm going to turn this off for a second. So do we have another question or um, about anything? Yes, sir. Hi, General. Thank you for coming. Uh, I had a. I just wanted to ask you: Do you think that uh, if the ATM we survive, that America survives this administration, that um, that we could keep the ATM? You know? It's a disaster to our military. I think Senator McCain is pretty committed to keeping the A 10 until he sees a more solid plan for who is going to perform the Eclipse Air Support Mission and whether that's during this administration or the next, you know, I don't know. But I, I do think, and, and he's not alone, well, there's other senators on the Hill that have been very outspoken about this Air Force plan. And the Chief of Staff has, has clearly told them, you know, it costs me $350 million a year to operate this aircraft. If you give me that much more in my budget, I'll be happy to keep it. I don't want it to go away. I just can't afford everything 
that you've asked me to do, I need more money. Now, whether that's just a play for money, I don't know. You know, they, you know, they've seen me with Congress, uh, you know, I'm not up there, I don't know what it's like, but, you know, I, I, I think the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee, there's members on both of those committees that are very, on the record, is saying that the intent's not going to go away until they see something on the books that's more substantial than what we're seeing today. So I think you'll see it for a while here. Well, I'd sure like to thank uh, General Saylor for being here. It's an honor to have you come to this Kilroy. It's an honor that he'll be our speaker um, in August for the Vietnam Federation. And uh, we hope you'll come back anytime that you can and have coffee with all of us, right? And I wanted to give you this as a gift to remember the War of the Army's inviting, so I know you collect those. Thank yeah. you all. Thanks again for your service. First it. Thank you for your service to our country for so many years.